Samantha Crocky is the president and CEO of the Illinois Policy Institute. He lives in Chicago with his wife Anna and their daughter Fiona and son Rocky. Where I've been uh, making a lot of smiles around here. We're, we're fortunate to have him here. A Mac graduated from the University of Notre Dame. He's an avid reader, a reluctant runner. Can't wait to hear about that. And a self-taught banjo player. Did you bring it? The banjo? No. Okay. <laughs> That's where the booze would start. So I'm gonna. <laughs> He's an Illinois committee member of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. He's a fourth degree Knight of Columbus. And I, I am told that you belong to St. John Cantius in Chicago. He's currently writing a book about free market and Catholic solutions to poverty in America. Please welcome Matt Thank you, thank you. I am, I'm so excited to be here. Uh, for a variety of reasons, but first is uh, I got a call from Kevin, who asked me if I would come speak to this group. And so Kevin wants to know about what I'm gonna talk about. So he says, what, what topics are you interested in? What do you wanna talk about? I said, Kevin, I can talk about a bunch of things. And he said, Matt, one thing I love about you is your commitment to free speech. And I said, Kevin, I love free speech. I'm happy to talk about it. And he goes, no, 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 that's what you're gonna be giving, a free speech. Um, <laughs> So here we are, here we are. Uh, but I was so delighted to do that because uh, this is such a great room, not only from the people who are here, but it's, it's these communities, right? These Catholic communities that I really have faith are going to save this country, are gonna save this state. Uh, I am so honored, especially with, with the people who we have in this room. Uh, I have my good friends, uh, the Wikers are here, the Selvies who are fantastic friends. My wife, uh, who never comes to any of my speeches, uh, came out of retirement for this one. Uh, my Aunt Joanne, and a question that I heard uh, loosely 50 times as I walked around the room is, are you related to the bishop? Um, and I am not related to the bishop. My wife often joked, if we had a son, we are going to name him Bishop. So we said, yes, that's my son. Uh, as you heard, uh, his name is Peter and we call him Rocky. But the real loser on this is my uncle, who is a Catholic priest and is right here. Uh, Father David, thank you for coming. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so during that introduction, uh, David said I am the, the CEO or the president of the Illinois Policy Institute, which is true. But my most important role is not that. Uh, my most important role in life is as, as a son of God. Uh, it is to be the husband of my beautiful wife, Anna, uh, and, the, and the father of my two children who are here today. But I will tell you that being the president uh, comes with its perks, and especially credibility with uh, my kids here. So I was having a conversation. When you run a free market think tank, you sit around the kitchen table and you discuss things like founding fathers. So we're having this conversation about George Washington and, and Thomas Jefferson, President Monroe, and we're having this conversation about these great men who sacrificed, right? They sacrificed for us in this belief, in this idea of a country where people could be free. And so we're talking about the commitment that they had to this country. And uh, as we're discussing this, I turned to my daughter and I said, Fiona, who is your favorite president of all time? She looks at me and she turns her head. She looks over at my wife and, and she gives us this look like, do you really want me to answer this? And I said, yeah, Fiona, who is it? And normally I play a video, uh, but I have the girl right here. Fiona, come on up here. I want to ask you the question. Fiona, who is your favorite president of all time? My favorite president of all time is the president of the Illinois Policy Institute. My dad. <laughs> Move aside, George Washington. I got one. I got one. Uh, yeah, so she says it here, too. But, uh... But, it, but I want to talk a bit about, so I got my start doing this about 20 years ago. So I got hired to work for the Illinois General Assembly. And, and there I was a legislative analyst. So I, I analyzed bills and it was one of the best jobs I've ever had because you could see great pieces of legislation help lift people up, right? And terrible pieces of legislation keep people in dependency and it pushes them down. And I love my job. But one day I got a phone call that changed my life. I went in my office and I picked up the phone, it was ringing, um, and it was from my mom. 
and her voice was trembling on the other end. And I, you could tell right away that something was wrong. And I answered the phone. I said, yeah, Mom. And she goes, uh, Matt, I'm at the hospital right now. And she said, um, the doctors just found a lump in my stomach, and I've just been diagnosed with stomach cancer. And I sat there. I unfortunately uh, had gotten phone calls like this in the past. My father had died six years earlier uh, of throat cancer. And so I did uh, what I knew I needed to do. I sat in my office. I felt, I felt the energy and everything go out of my body. And in tears, I walked over to my boss's office. And I'm still crying. And I said, I can't work here anymore. Right? I'm going home, and I'm going to go take care of my mother. And I had one of the blessings of my life. I got to take care of the person who raised me, right? the person who loved me more than anyone. But as we all know, the pains of cancer are terrible. And every day she got weaker and weaker. And we had this, all you want is to provide somebody some sort of momentary relief right inside of this. And so I found a way. And every night I would get down on the ground and I would rub her feet. I would take lotion, I would rub her feet. And my hope was that she would find a small moment of peace, right? And my, my real dream was that she would fall asleep, right? So that she could sleep through the night. Uh, and so I would be down on the ground and I'd rub, rub her feet. And to my everlasting frustration, every time I would look up, she'd be wide-eyed and she'd be <laughs> smiling at me. And I'll say to this very day, this is my vision on God. It's a parent who loves their child so much that despite all the pain that they see in the world and all the suffering, they can't keep their eyes off of their son and they can't keep but smiling. This happened day after day and on one cold December day, I go down on the ground, I'm rubbing her feet. She's thin and she's weak. I see her open her eyes a little bit, a smile creeps on her face. She breathes her last breath and she dies. I fell on the ground, I'm crying, and I feel something buzz in my pocket. And before I ever pick up the phone, I know who it is. Because they've been calling me every day for the last eight months. I wasn't working a job, I wasn't getting a paid, well, I wasn't getting paid, so I was defaulting on all my loans, on every bill that I had. It was another collection agency. So I went back home after a while, after we started getting things sorted out, I had a, a place in uh, the north side of Chicago. I go back to my studio apartment, I flip on the light switch. Nothing happens. All of a sudden, as I step inside that room, something hits me, and it's this waft of rotten air. The electricity had been cut off in my apartment, and so all my food, the one asset that I had was rotten. I left my studio apartment because I knew I needed to go back to my mother's, my mother's estate, the home that she had there. And so I walk over to the train station, I pull out my wallet, I look inside, and I didn't have one buck to my name. And I remember thinking, I have to get on that train. I have to get back home. But I have no money. And so my first thought is I look over at the turnstile. Now I'm 25 years old, and I think, if I could jump that, right? I still think I could jump that. But there's a voice, and it was the voice of my mom in the back of my head saying, Matt, what are you doing? Why would you do this? And so I stood there. I took a deep breath. My heart started racing. I started sweating because I knew what I'd have to do. I'd have to beg. So I turned around and I reached out my hand. I saw a man, I can't forget, he had gray hair. He would have been about my father's age. And I looked at him, I said, sir, I've, I, I, just, I don't have any money. I just have to get back to my parents' place. And I'll never forget, he wouldn't even look at me. And I felt something there in my heart that I've never felt until that moment in my life. And it's this weird combination of hopelessness and sadness. And there's a word for it called despair. And that was the first moment that I've ever felt despair. I remember I turned around and I see the train racing by and I thought to myself, I don't know if I'm better off getting on that train or jumping in front of it. I'd lost everything. I was 25 years old. Both my parents had passed away. I had no job. I had no money. And I had no hope. And so I sat there and I begged and I begged and I begged. And finally, I cobbled enough money to get on that train. And I remember sitting on that train and looking at the window reflection of myself and being embarrassed at the man that I saw looking back at me. And at that point in my life, I would have qualified for every, every government aid, 
from food stamps to Section 8 housing, you name it, I qualified. But I never took it. Because the thought of applying and begging somebody else for money to give me more money, it filled me with despair. Right? That same despair that I felt while begging. And so I said at that moment, God, if you can ever pull me out of this, right? if we can ever work together, if I ever get out of this, I will dedicate my life to pulling other people out of despair so they never have to feel the same way that I felt that day. And that's what we've done. Uh, obviously, I uh, am no longer begging for money. We are having this conversation at uh, Maggiano's and not at the train station on Clark and Lake. So that's spoiler alert on how this story ends here. Thank you, thank you. But the interesting part about this is what I thought that I was going to have to address was uh, the poor, right? These people who felt that they had no options, that they had the same level of despair. But what I've realized inside of my career here at the Illinois Policy Institute is this is not just something that the poor wrestle with. This is a question for all of us. I meet with donors and prospective donors, and I ask the question, what keeps you up at night? And I've gotten some really sad answers. And it's this level of despair about the state of Illinois. They look around and they say, I don't have hope. I've given up. Right? And that, that is the same type of despair. It is this belief that we cannot fix this problem. And I've got to be honest. There's good reasons to feel that way. Now, I look at it, and I think there's three main problems that we have in the state of Illinois right now. Number one, we all know this. Uh, we have one of the, uh, the highest rates of corruption in any state in the entire nation, right? This started with uh, the organized mafia and moved on to what was the Chicago machine, and now there's a new form. It's called uh, public sector unions. We see it uh, most predominantly inside of the Chicago Teachers Union, but this is the new form of the machine and corruption that we see in uh, the state of Illinois today. The second is financial problems. This we all feel, right? We get our property tax bill. We're paying taxes. And the question is we look around and we say, what are we paying for? Right? Our schools are failing. Our roads are falling apart. So why are we paying so much and where is this going to? And the third is poverty. Is uh, the poor continue to stay poor? And we're not seeing them rise up. And so there's the question on what do we do about it? So what I want to do is I want to start with uh, one of the centralized problems with this, and uh, this goes a bit into corruption. This goes into Chicago Public Schools proficiency in math and reading. So the chart starts in 2010, and I use this uh, for a reason. In 2010, about 80% of kids could uh, do math at grade level, and about 70% of kids could read at grade level in the city of Chicago. The reason I use this is something happened in 2010. There's a group of people inside of the Chicago Public uh, Teachers Union called the Caucus of Rank and File Educators. This was led by Karen Lewis uh, and a group of socialists who decided that if they could take over the teachers union, they could gain power and influence. And they did. And we see that when they took over this union, they were fighting for, they closed 50 schools, which I will argue should have been closed. And we have about 100 more schools that should be closed tomorrow. But kids were doing all right, right? If you went to a public school, you were doing okay. Since they have had leadership, uh, ability to read and write hovers around 20%, right? Meaning if you live in the city of Chicago, your kid has one in five chance of reading at grade level. So the first question, or the first thing I thought was, well, they need more money, right? If we just, if we reduce class size, if we gave them more money and access to information, how would this work? Well, so we looked that up. Chicago Public Schools operating budget since 2019 was at $6 billion. We are now at $8.5 billion. The average student receives about $30,000 every single year so that one in five of them can read or write at grade level. Now, don't get, I want to be clear on this. This is not just a problem that's happening in my city of Chicago. This is happening throughout the state. Public education funding coming from the state aid formula has increased dramatically from 2014, whereas at about $6.5 billion, that has now nearly doubled uh, to $10.5 billion. So what's been the results? We have a, a dramatic reduction inside of reading and in math that starts in 2015. So in our state, 35% of kids can read at grade level and 27% can do math at grade level. This is a complete an utter failure and shows what corruption does inside of our education system. Uh, we see the same thing in SAT scores. These have gone down consistently uh, inside of public education systems. 
Uh, J.K. Chesterton said, without education, we are in horrible and deadly danger of taking educated people seriously. <laughs> I think that's true. This presentation might be sponsored by G.K. Chesterton, too. So, uh, But then we also talked about finances. What's happening with finances, and why do we pay these exorbitant tax bills and we don't know where it goes to? Well, the reason's clear. In Illinois and Chicago, pensions and debt services take up 40% of our budget. Think about this. Think about your tax bill. Think about your income tax bill. If we got rid of the, the huge pension costs that we have and the huge debt service we have, we could reduce your taxes by 40% tomorrow. Uh, Chicago is, is a, a unique beast uh, because if Chicago's pension system was a state, we would have the seventh worst funding liability than any state in the nation, uh, behind ourselves in the state of Illinois, which is the second worst. We're looking at $200 billion in unfunded pension liability inside of the state of Illinois right now. Uh, Corruption. So this is uh, Speaker Mike Madigan. Uh, he was the longest running Speaker of the House in United States history. Uh, this has been the embodiment of corruption. Uh, he grew stronger and stronger. He was able to build a fiefdom. Uh, when he took over uh, as Speaker of the House, Illinois had one of the highest credit ratings in the nation. Uh, today we have the worst. Uh, and this has been under his leadership. But as I talked about, we have a new face of corruption. With Speaker Madigan out, this is now the Chicago Teachers Union, led by Stacey Davis Gates. You have Jesse Sharkey, who's the vice president, and uh, Randy Weingartner, who's the head of uh, the uh, education, National Education Association. But this is the face of corruption right now uh, in our state. And what happens, right? When you have failing schools, when you have increased costs, when you're not getting any sort of benefit from it, and you have this high level of corruption that continues, well, people leave, right? And this is what we're seeing. We now saw, this is 2022, uh, 104,000 people left our state, and we know it, right? They're our neighbors, they're our friends, they're the people who live in our community. So all of this has been rather depressing. So the question becomes, what do we do about it, right? What do we do about this as residents inside of this state what do we do about it as Catholics? Well, the first advice that I have on this is uh, do not despair. 2 Corinthians 4, 16. Uh, you know, in, in Catholicism, despair is a sin. And the reason it's a sin is because you are saying, God, I do not believe that you can help solve this problem, right? It's saying, I don't think that God can help solve the pension problem or the corruption problem inside of the state of Illinois, right? So the first act is we shouldn't despair. But more proactively about this, I think that there's three main solutions that we can do as Catholics to solve this problem. The first is faith, the second is hope, and the third is charity. Right? These are the theological virtues. These are the virtues that we often pray when we start a rosary. Right? We say for an increase in faith, for an increase in hope, for an increase in charity. Here's where I've often got this wrong. When I was praying the rosary as we've gone through it, I was always praying for it for other people. Right? I always thought, how could we increase faith of somebody else? How do we increase hope of other people? How do we increase their charity? But what I realized and where I was wrong is the prayer is to ourselves. Right? Because none of these words, these are not passive ideas. All of these words are actionable. Right? And they're actionable inside of the catechism. And it says faith is an action that we have to take. Right? What, what steps are we going to take? Not just the belief in God, but are we going to take active steps to pursue him? The same with hope. We get hope wrong. And I've traditionally thought that hope was like uh, being optimistic. But they're different. And it's actually quite different. You can be pessimistic and still be hopeful. Let me give you an example. Can I get a show of hands? How many people believe there's a heaven? How many people in this room? How many people are optimistic they're going there? I have pretty good numbers. I got to say. Um, I don't ever always feel that confident. But what I believe is I'm hopeful. And what we all do as Catholics, the reason we're in this room is because we're hopeful. Hope takes an action. That means getting together as Catholic friends and brothers. That means we go to church on Sunday and we receive communion. We go and we, we have reconciliation and we confess our sins. We go to adoration. Hope is an action. And so I believe when we go, when we go stand in front of God, am I sure if, I, if I'm going to heaven or not? I don't know, but I sure am hopeful, right? And I will continue to work on this every day of my life. 
And the third is charity. Uh, charity is an interesting word because it's defined very differently. Uh, if we look throughout texts inside of the Bible, charity is often uh, a different word. And uh, when we hear St. Paul talk about uh, in 1 Corinthians 13 that uh, the greatest of these are faith, hope, and charity, what he actually says in this is faith, hope, and agape. Agape doesn't mean charity. Agape means love. And it's a specific type of love. Uh, it's, a, it's a type of love. I say, you know, uh, C.S. Lewis has a book called uh, The Four Loves, which I've brought copies of today that I would like to distribute. I brought three copies. Uh, the first three people who ask questions after this are getting a copy of The Four Loves. <laughs> but what C.S. Lewis says inside of this is there's four different types of love. And we all know this. We use the same word for them, right? The first is eros. This is the root word of erotic, right? An erotic love. This is the love that you have for your husband or your wife, right? This is the one love that I have for my wife, Anna. Then there's another love called storgi, right? This is the love that we have for our children. And we have a love for our parents, right? Those are two very different things, right? How I feel about my kids and how I feel about my wife. They're still love, but different terms. The third is philia, right? This is a... Uh, Right, comes from Philadelphia. This is a brotherly love. It's a love that we have for our friends. But the highest love is agape. And this is what St. Paul is talking about. The greatest of these is love. And that is the love that Jesus Christ had for us. It's a sacrificial love. It's a love that you are willing to die for somebody else. Right? In our world, that's time. Mostly it's time. But it's will you die and sacrifice for somebody else. This is what Jesus is calling us for. This is the radical type of charity. But I want to give uh, examples of what this actually looks like. Ooh, going the wrong way. So this, is, uh, this comes from uh, the book of Matthew, Matthew 14. Right? So this comes after Jesus has just fed 5,000 people. And he tells his disciples, get inside the boat. So they go off by themselves in a boat. Jesus goes to the mountain to pray. And what it says in the Bible is this picture wouldn't be right because they're by land there. They are miles out inside the water and a storm hits. It's the middle of the night. They're dark and scared. And Jesus appears right on the water and he says, be not afraid. And Peter looks at him and Peter says, if it's you, tell me to come to you. And Jesus says, yes, right? So what does Peter do? He gets out of the boat, right? And this is what God asks all of us to do. This is faith. That is faith in action. It's no longer just thinking about these ideas and saying, God, I believe in you. It's stepping out into the boat and getting on the water. But then he realizes, he looks at where he's at, right? And he sees all the problems in the turbulent water, and he sinks, right? But what God is asking us is, have faith, have faith, right? Don't doubt, don't look at all these other things that are happening in our world. Keep your eyes on me, and things will be okay. The second uh, is hope. And I think uh, the greatest example of hope is uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe uh, in Juan Diego. But actually, my wife gave me a, a good uh, note this morning. We were talking about hope, and she said, you know who had hope, who worked actively every day towards a different future? Joe Scheidler. Scheidler. Right, here's a man who fought with his life, amen to that, who fought every day of his life to see the overturning of Roe versus Wade. Did he see it in his lifetime? No. But I promise you, where he is going to be getting his reward is certainly with the kingdom of heaven, right? That is a great example of what hope looks like. It's fighting, it's planting a seed for a tree that you will never see bear fruit. And that is what Joe Scheidler did. But I want to tell you a quick story about uh, Juan Diego, because this, uh, this is one of my favorite saints. So Juan Diego, so it's uh, 1530, modern day Mexico, right? Mexico doesn't exist, right? So this is... 40, 38 years after Columbus discovers America. And the Spanish start sending over people to what is modern day Mexico. And he says, they, they're trying to convert the indigenous people there. But it's going terribly, like it is terrible, to the fact that the indigenous people are murdering the priests. All of the people who are there are getting killed one by one by one. Do they give up? Do they turn around and say, I'm hopeless? They kept fighting. And finally, they get to one guy, right? They get to a peasant, somebody who has no money, who has almost nothing. His name's Juan Diego. Juan Diego goes, and he's, he's going to Mass one day, right? He goes to Tepeyac Hill, and he sees an apparition of Mary, right? The miracle happens. 
So he goes back and he runs to his people. He goes to the bishop and he says, look who I just saw. I saw the mother of God and she said, build a church here. The bishop looked at me and goes, you're lying. Right? Here's a poor man who abandoned his people to follow God and his own bishop tells him, you're lying. Get out of here. Right? And I think that we sit there a lot in our own lives, that when we get told no, when some door doesn't work, we just give up. But Juan Diego doesn't. Right? What does he do? He doesn't walk, but he runs back to that hill. And Mary's there. Mary famously says, pick up these roses, right? It's the middle of December. They wouldn't have been blooming. He puts them in his tilma. He walks back to the bishop, and he wants to show him these flowers. But instead of the flowers, we see Our Lady. Right? And the reason I tell this story is that Juan Diego spent the rest of his life inside of a hut next to this spot as they showed off the tilma of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And he told the story. And the result? 90 million people in Mexico today are Catholic because of what happened there that day. 90 million, the poorest among us. And you know what he did? He told a story. He talked about the miracle that happened. And that's what changed the world. That is the largest conversion event, non-forced, non-violent conversion event in world history was because of Juan Diego. The largest group of Catholics in the United States of America? They're Mexicans. Go into any of their house, what's the first thing you're gonna see? Our Lady of Guadalupe, right? This, uh, this has been, become the patron saint of the Illinois Policy Institute. Uh, what we do inside of our organization is we tell stories. We talk about the impact. We talk about the miracles that we've seen, right, in our own lives. And often we don't talk about them. You know the reason I'm passionate about the free market and I care about it? In our lifetimes, this room, two billion people have been lifted up out of poverty worldwide. What did that? The free market, right? Capitalism, the rule of law, right? Global trade, that's what did it. That you've done to the least of my brothers, that you've done unto me. But we shouldn't keep that miracle quiet. We should celebrate this, right? We should talk about it. And we should tell that story, and that's exactly what we've done. Our theory for change is how do we tell the story? Um, we started sending emails every single day to people. A lot of uh, you in the room are uh, friends and donors of the Illinois Policy Institute. First, thank you. But what you've invested in is completely changing how people are consuming information. At the beginning of the year, uh, every week, 375,000 people were opening our emails. We've continued to tell stories every single day. Uh, the last week of the year, last year, uh, 1.5 million people are opening our emails on a weekly basis. Uh, that accounts for nearly 40 million opens uh, every year in the state of Illinois. To show a comparison of what that does, uh, right here this shows our opens every single day, the Illinois Policy Institute, the next is Chicago Tribune, WBEZ, sometimes in Cranes, Chicago. More people are reading about the stories we're talking about. Uh, than all of those newspapers and magazines combined. And finally, this, uh, this shows the op-eds that we publish in Target op or, uh, outlets. We look at national publications. This is the Washington Post, this is the Wall Street Journal, uh, the Chicago Tribune, and the Sun-Times. Uh, we have had 34 or 43 publications. Our next competitor, I don't like to put competitors' names because I don't want to embarrass them. Uh, this is uh, B -E -G or BGA. Uh, who spends over $10 million on full-time uh, journalists at their organization. They had 21 op-eds published last year. But I will say, none of this matters, right? Like the numbers I just showed you, this doesn't matter at all. Uh, these are activities. Activities need to lead to outcomes, right? This is what we invest in. Uh, but what we've seen is that if we build an audience and we tell the right message at the right time, things change. This happened three and a half years ago when the progressive tax went on the ballot. The day they put it on the ballot, support for it was at 65%. Uh, opposition was uh, in the mid-30s. We went around and we told stories. We talked about the effects it would have on business owners, what it would do to the economic climate. Uh, the, the key finding we had was we saw that in every other state that has a graduated income tax, they have a retirement tax. And when we told that story, the progressive tax changed, where support dropped to under 50%, and opposition uh, increased where it died on the ballot. And every year when they bring it back up, I get every lawmaker, when I ask them, will you vote for this? And they go, hell no. Right? That's how we can change the narrative. Speaker Mike Madigan, uh, I talked about him. What we saw that is very interesting is that 
He had 16% favorables in 2012. Uh, his unfavorable was about 35%, but 40% of people didn't know them. Who we talk to is this audience, right? It's how do you convert people who don't know, who haven't been evangelized yet? So we started telling the stories of corruption, what he did. We wrote a documentary. A million people watched it. We put it out. We ran throughout the state showing it in cinemas. The result is that after the documentary came out, his unfavorables went from 35% to 63%, and only 2% of people didn't know who he was. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, eventually, he dropped nearly 55 points, uh, where he dropped to a 71% unfavorable, where in 2021, he was kicked out by his own caucus because he was so unfavorable and toxic to their brand. Uh, the Chicago Teachers Union. Uh, I was just talking with uh, one of the people who worked for Rahm Emanuel's team recently, and he said every year they would poll the Chicago Teachers Union, and they would poll wildly favorably. 65% of people inside the state of Illinois think that uh, the Chicago Teachers Union is a wonderful organization. So we looked at this, but we also saw that a big number of people didn't know about them and didn't care. So we wrote a documentary. We tell stories. We talk about Stacey Davis Gates, who's the head of the Chicago Teachers Union, and we expose that she sends her kid to De La Salle, a private school. Why do you think? Because their kid wouldn't be able to read otherwise. So we told the story. At first, they were uh, favorable. Uh, their favorables were plus 18, which means if you take their favorables minus their unfavorables, uh, so they were plus 18. Uh, we told the story. This is the beginning of this year, February. We told their story. We wrote a documentary called Local One. You can watch this on YouTube. Uh, it has been watched 1.5 million times throughout the state. And we just got polling back the other day that the Chicago Teachers Union are at negative 9%. This is the weakest they have ever been. Um, <laughs> And this gives us opportunity to reform, right? Because again, this matters so that we can pass legislation for school choice. So that every kid, no matter what district they live in, they have an opportunity. But now we have an opportunity to go pass legislation and move it inside the state is because of them. And the final person I want to talk about is charity, right? Love. Mother Teresa. St. Mother Teresa. And the thing that I love about St. Mother Teresa is uh, she's often misunderstood. You know, this is a woman who lived in Calcutta, and we think about her all the time as somebody who fed the poor and, and helped to feed people. But there is something interesting because uh, they've gotten her all wrong. Uh, actually, famously, uh, President Clinton in 1994, he invites Mother Teresa to come to the National Prayer Breakfast. And he says, Mother Teresa, I want you to come uh, here. And two days before she shows up at the National Prayer Breakfast, they want to impress her, right? They're going to show her. We're the United States of America, and look at how amazing we are. So they go take her to an old folks home, right? And they go take her to this nursing home, and they're walking around, and they want to show people aren't starving here. We have TVs. Everything is clean. This is not Calcutta. Look at how amazing we are. And Mother Teresa walks out of there, and she goes to the National Prayer Breakfast two days later, and she tells a story. And I, uh, the audio is not working right now, so I'm going to read what she said. I can never forget the experience I had in visiting a home where they kept all these old parents of sons and daughters who had just put them into an institution and forgotten them, maybe. I saw that in that home, these old people had everything, good food, comfortable place, television, everything but everyone was looking toward the door. And I did not see a single one with a smile on the face. I turned to the sister and I, why do these people who have every, every comfort here, they are they looking toward the door? Why are they not smiling? I'm so used to seeing the smiles on our people, even the dying ones smile. As sister said, this is the way it is nearly every day. They are expecting, they are hoping that the son or the daughter will come to visit them. They are hurt because they are forgotten. And see, this neglect to love brings spiritual poverty. So what Mother Teresa goes on to say is she goes, I have lived in Calcutta for years. I have picked worms off of dying man's bodies. 
I have never seen poverty worse than what I'm seeing right now in the United States of America. This is what she's talking about on how do we address poverty. She's talking about poverty, a uh, spiritual poverty. How do we lift up that individual person so that they feel dignity, right? They feel closeness with God. Dignity, and the dignity of the human person is that God created us in his image and likeness. He asked us to be like him, right? To be a reflection of what that is. And what she's saying is, is here's these poor families with these people who are stuck with nobody who loves them, nobody who's caring, nobody who will sacrifice and die for them. And she says this, this is the worst type of poverty in the world. And it was because of Mother Teresa's call, well, when we look at what can we do in the state of Illinois, well, the first thing is easy. We have to end corruption, right? We have to end this reign of, of the Chicago machine, of Speaker Mike Madigan, and of the Chicago Teachers Union, who right now are getting rich on the back of our children, of our tax money. We will end this, and we will continue to fight to get to the point that every kid knows how to read at grade level, that every kid has an opportunity to go find a job and to see dignity inside of work. The second is to pass pension reform. Uh, I just had a conversation about along these lines uh, just the other day with the Civic Committee. I think there's a real opportunity to end the pension system as we see it right now, make a reform going forward, and end the structure that we have. When we do this, our taxes change. 40% of that we'll either get back or we can invest inside of the people in this state. And the final is reduce welfare. Uh, and I mean this very deliberately. I have done a lot of research on what poverty looks like in America. I've looked at what it looks like uh, in the, the erosion of dignity. And one of the biggest problems we have right now in this, the United States of America is a huge welfare system. And it's the same welfare system I started this conversation. What we are doing right now is we are paying young men and women not to work, and what it's taking away is their dignity, right? They are living lives of despair, and they don't have that. So to address that, we have just launched the Center for Poverty Solutions. Um, this is a, a new organization inside of the Illinois Policy Institute. It is led by my good friend, Dr. Ed Cornegay, right here. Come on, shake your hand. Uh, Dr. Cornegay. <laughs> Dr. Cornegay is taking a new approach on poverty. No longer is it the same idea of let's just give food and resources to the poor. Instead, the goal here, let's lift them up, right? Let's find them work. Let's find them opportunities, and let's restore their dignity. And that's exactly what we're going to do. The measurement of success in the next five years is we are going to move 5% of the population inside of uh, the city of Chicago from welfare to work, right, from dependency to dignity. But let me show you some numbers, and I want to talk about a, a quick miracle that we have also seen in our life. Uh, the number on the left was the poverty rate when Lyndon Johnson declared a war on poverty. Uh, so he says, we have a huge poverty problem in America, and the poverty rate was about 13%. Uh, I have dug in and I have looked into the numbers of who is in poverty. And what that means is, do you have enough money to eat, essentially is what that number is looking at. If you count in wealth transfers, um, that is SNAP benefits, food stamps, Section 8 housing uh, transfers, the poverty rate in America right now is 1.1%. That is an amazing achievement. If we take Matthew 25 literally, right, I was hungry and you fed me. I was naked and you clothed me. That's happened right in our lifetime. And I think at a, at a certain point we should look at this and we should celebrate. And we should say this is an amazing achievement. But it doesn't end there. Because what we've done inside of that is we now see, this is uh, the labor market, the blue line shows people, the red line shows the unemployment rate, which everybody knows, right? We look at the unemployment rate, but the blue line shows something very different. These are people who have exited the workforce. So these are, this chart looks at males, age 35 to 54. These are able-bodied, prime-age men. And what we are seeing is that they are exiting the workforce in a record number. Right, this is the quiet poverty that's happening in America that we don't see because there's no longer bread lines. They're no longer starving on the streets. They are well paid, they have places to live, they have clothes and they're fed. So what's happening to them? Well, what we've seen in recent years is that these people are dying at the highest level we've ever seen. These, these deaths are what uh, Princeton uh, economist Ann Case calls deaths of despair. They come in three forms. They're largely happening to able-bodied adult men who are in their working ages. 
Uh, and they are dying predominantly from suicide, drug addiction, uh, opioid use, and liver failure from drinking. This is happening so rapidly in the United States of America that life expectancy in America has dropped for men. And if you look at the, uh, the other, the green line above it, that is comparable to other countries. And the reason this is happening, it's happening to one group, able-bodied adult men who aren't working, who are on welfare. Right now, our money is going to kill our brothers, our sons, and our family members. We have taken away their dignity, and without a purpose, right, without seeing God in themselves, they're killing themselves. This is what we have to eradicate. This is what we have to fight against. And this is why we have started this fight, is to make sure that we can go lift up these individuals, because this shouldn't be happening in our country, right? That men who can work are not working, and they're getting paid extremely well for it. So how do we do this? This is a good friend of mine. His name is Stephen Blake. I met Stephen uh, when he was homeless. He lived on the streets of Chicago. He was right outside the opera house. I would, every day I run into work, I put my suit, this suit goes in a backpack, and I run in three miles. And I would run by Stephen, where he was laying on the ground. Stephen had no dignity. Well, he had dignity, right? He had the dignity that God gave him. But it had been taken away. He had food. He had money. And one day Stephen tells me, he goes, Matt, I'm going to start selling fruit to commuters. So one day he goes out of his tent, he walks over outside of the opera house, and he goes and buys fruit from the grocery store, and he sells it. And he does it the next day, and the next day, and the next day. I'm happy to report that Stephen Blake is no longer homeless. He now has a home. He now is off all government assistance, and he's currently hiring two new employees to sell fruit alongside of him. And when I talk to Stephen about this, he says, Matt, the solution to poverty in America, it's not handouts. It's the dignity of work. This is a woman named Claudia Perez. Claudia Perez lives in Pilsen, and she wakes up at 4 o'clock every single morning, and she makes delicious and you know, homemade tamales to feed her family and her neighbors, and she sells them, pushing that food cart right there. Twice a year, Chicago police walk over to her food cart, they dump out her food, they step on the ground, and they say, what you're selling is garbage. They have taken her dignity and they step on it because food carts are illegal in the city of Chicago. The Restaurant Association didn't want them there, so Claudia Perez has to operate doing something illegally, uh, and it's taken away her dignity. So we went and told her story. We brought Claudia out, we put together a video, and we brought it to City Hall, and two years ago, we passed legislation. Claudia Perez right now is on the west side of Chicago. She is legally selling tamales out of her food cart, along with hundreds of other food cart vendors who can now do that legally in the city of Chicago. Lisa Creason was 19 years old when she made the mistake of her lifetime. She walked into a Subway sandwich shop. She robbed it. She was arrested, and she went to jail. She had a small kid at the time, a small daughter at the time, and she was in jail crying, and she said, if I get out of this, I promise I never want my daughter to know I'm a criminal. So she went to school. She went to college. And a decade later, Lisa Creason graduated with a nursing license. She says she calls her mom. She's overjoyed. She goes, Mom, my kids will never know me as a criminal. They'll know me as a nurse. So she's so excited, she goes and applies for a nursing license. It's rejected. She has a felony two decades previously. Lisa Creason cannot be a nurse uh, in her dignity. And what the government told her is, you belong on welfare, right? You do not deserve the dignity of work. So we told Lisa's story. We sat inside of the Illinois State Capitol day after day. One day, three years ago, Lisa looks at all of the people who are going to decide and vote for her bill and she sees that her future is bright. Lisa says for the first time in years, she felt hope. The bill passed inside of the Illinois General Assembly. Right now, Lisa is a registered nurse in the state of Illinois, and there are now 2,000 nurses who could not have been otherwise who are working, right, who have been lifted from welfare to work. And when I asked Lisa, she goes, the solution towards, uh, towards poverty in America it's not handouts. 
It's the dignity of work and what she's felt. And so what we are doing under the leadership of Dr. Cornegay is we are passing laws throughout the state of Illinois in municipalities, on school boards and county boards to lift people up. And the response is, we're lowering the welfare rates in the state of Illinois. We're lifting people up so that they too can be co-creators as God has asked all of us to do. And we are restoring the dignity of the human people throughout the state of Illinois. So the question that I want to close with is, is uh, how do we save Illinois? Well, I think it's pretty simple. We have faith. We trust in God and we take active steps. We have hope. And this is not just being pessimistic or optimistic. It is taking active steps to pursue a better future. And the final is charity, or better phrased, agape. It is love. How do we love our neighbor? And how do we actually take care of them instead of feeding them to lift them up and restore them to that dignity that God has in their vision for their lives? G.K. Chesterton says a true soldier fights not because he hates what's in front of him, but because he loves what's behind him. The reason I fight and the reason that I do this are because of these two, who are right here, actually. He got a lot bigger since then. That is Nani. Um, but we fight for our family, and we fight for our friends, and we fight for our neighbors. Because the truth is, these are the biggest investments we make inside of our lives. And what we have to fight for is not because we hate the other side, the side we disagree with. It's because we love our neighbors and our friends and your children. Right? I gave this talk uh, four months ago, and I said, and you know who I love? I love people like Stephen Blake. And Stephen Blake was in the audience. And Stephen stands up, he goes, I love you too, Matt. <laughs> and I was standing on stage and I almost started crying. Um, because every time that I've given money to a, to a soup kitchen or a food shelter, they haven't loved me back. And the reason is I haven't loved them. Right, but when we sacrifice and we die for each other, that's the result, is love. And ultimately, this moment that we have right now, it's fleeting. And the truth is, is we will all die, right? This is a flash in the history of the world. But one day we are going to stand in front of God and we are going to look him in the face and he is going to say, did you have faith? Did you have hope? Did you have charity? Right? That's why we fight for these things, to lift up our brothers and sisters and to love them. And the reason that we fight at the Illinois Policy Institute, the reason we started the Center for Poverty Solutions is that when that day comes for me, I'm going to look him in the face and I'm going to say, I hope so. Thank you all. God bless you. Thank 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 you. Matt, you'll take a couple questions? I will. <laughs> Guys, I got books. I have books. Uh, <laughs> I'm here in the back of the room. Matt, since the uh, public education system seems to want to be like basically a monopoly, I mean, should the whole thing just be privatized and just have once in? Everyone has the three choices go where they want to go, and you know, then therefore there isn't all this kind of corruption with taxes. And then also, too, once taxes would go down because then you're not paying all these taxes for schools that some people don't even use because they send them to private schools or they homeschool or whatever. That's right. Uh, so that's a great question. And the question is, is what should we do with public education? Uh, certainly, we need large scale reform inside of it. Uh, two days ago, I went to a small school on the west side of Chicago. It's called um, Chicago Hope Academy. And I've heard that there's this thing that happens. There's a private school, um, a Christian school. And I went there because they're in the second worst neighborhood in Chicago. But every day, the principal stands outside and he greets all of the students. And so every, every kid walks in and he knows their names. He knows their cars. Who's driving the car? What happened the day before? I'm sitting there in awe. I, as he's calling out people's names and he's like, 
Jamal, how we doing? Hey, man, I saw you at the game yesterday. You took a layup, but you jumped off your, the wrong foot. What's up with that? He called out everybody's name and knew something about them. And what they felt was they felt loved. Um, this is in the second worst neighborhood in Chicago. And when you walk inside the school, what you see is banners. And it's banners for Dartmouth. Stand, it's banners for Northwestern, for Harvard. Um, some schools, which I wouldn't send my kids to, like Harvard at this point. But, but, but these kids are, these are the poorest. 95% of them are low income. 95% of them are black. Uh, they used to go to a school called Manly. Manly fills up 2,000 kids. It is two blocks away. Right now, the number of uh, kids who are at Manly High School, 60. Number of teachers and administrators, 75. 25% of the kids will graduate from high school. 0% of the kids can graduate or can read at grade level. These are the same kids in the same neighborhood. But given the opportunity, they can thrive, right? And what we have to do is we have to believe in our children. I believe the best solution that we can do is what's called education savings accounts. They're like backpacks for kids. So that when we go pay them, when we go give them money, they take the money they would give at the public school and they can go turn into the private school. So that they can go to a place, instead of $30,000, going to Manly High School that should be shut down tomorrow, they can go to some place like Ignatius. They can go to some place where they can thrive and do absolutely fantastic. So you're not double taxed, right. And what we'll see is we'll see a reduction in education spending, an increase in outcomes. But I will say the truth is, people will always go to public school. It will exist in some way, shape, or form. But what we have to do is find ways to lift up those schools as well. But the biggest part that I think, uh, and what I think is really the civil rights fight uh, of our lives right now, is poor kids shouldn't be stuck in bad schools. And we can change that, and we will change that here in the state of Illinois. Else? Yes, up front. Uh, man, I'm ashamed to admit I did not know anything about your Illinois Policy Institute. Well, welcome, welcome. This is evangelization, right? How do I get to find out about you on the internet? Or no. So there's going to be cards. Jim Long, who's a colleague of mine, uh, will have cards inside of the back of the room. I wanted to say this. Um, part of what matters for the future is that rooms like this exist, right? That we all associate together. I said a lot of things about you know, what we're fighting for. This isn't about me. This is because of donors. A lot of donors who are in this room, you're the ones who make it possible. You're the ones who made it possible for Stephen Blake to have dignity, right? It's our supporters who are the reason that Claudia Perez can go have a, a license and push a food cart, right? And so, but what we need to do is combine. I would ask all of you, and I would invite all of you, to come join in this fight. We can do nothing if it's not for groups and people like this who come read and forward our information. If you can donate, right? I will say, the, the example that I give, this is not something that I just run and I say, let's see what happens. When we started the Center for Poverty Solutions, I believe in this so much that my wife and I uh, have donated $10,000 to help get this thing started, right? But I need support, we need support everywhere, right? To go fight, to take those active steps, so please, uh, my email address is on the website. Uh, it's mcaprocky at illinoispolicy.org. Anybody can send me an email. I'll put you on our email list, um, or we can forward something around. But please reach out. But Jim Long will have contact information in the back. Thank you so much. I have one question here. Well, one thing you didn't mention at all was uh, the immigration, illegal immigration right now. And so I'm curious in terms of how you think that will impact the state of Illinois. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> so every day during my run, I run by the Laertie Police Station. And we saw for months outside this police station, families, women, and children the same age as my kids. And they were out there in freezing days laying on cement in front of a police station. Right? right? Um, Look, the first question is, you know, like, is about border, right? And uh, the question is, is, is not should they be here or not? They are here, right? They are inside of our, our state. So what do we do, right? And this is, it's heart-wrenching to me because, again, there's people the same age as my son Peter, and I see them while it's snowing on cement ground, and they do not have the clothes that are adequate. But the biggest travesty of this is this used to be a country that if you were poor, if you had no opportunity and even quite frankly, minimal education, 
you could work, right? You could find an opportunity to go sell goods or do some service. Right now in the United States of America, we are preventing every single one of these migrants from taking any job. So what's gonna happen to them? They're going to go into a welfare program where the government is going to continue to pay them money, as we're seeing, where the city of Chicago is going to pay hundreds of millions, and it will be billions of dollars, to keep them pulled down inside of this. Uh, what I believe we need to do here, give them an opportunity to work, right? Give them some temporary assistance that we can go give them jobs and let's lift up the communities that we have here. But I will say, this one's been heartbreaking. I talked to a friend of mine. We, you know, we have this mental image of poverty and people living on the streets. Uh, my friend was, uh, used to work for a former mayor. He said in the city of Chicago, there was never one day that the homeless shelters were full. Not one. Meaning that if you were clean and you wanted a place to sleep, you had it. Uh, this mayor and the socialistic structure he's running, it's a different world, right? And we're seeing that. We, I had a friend of mine who, uh, who is a lobbyist, but he had a business owner who said they have multiple warehouses and they wanted to put the migrants into it. But Mayor Johnson said that he didn't want to work with private businesses on this, right? That's where you see them trying to build that site, that tent city, that toxic land that they can't get it done. These things need to change. We need to get private businesses involved. We have to have people as community to go help lift them up. But quite frankly, let's get them jobs, let's put them to work, and let's give them the money and the dignity so that they can go fight that fight. I'm sorry. Well, we have our own people here who are looking for jobs right now. We have so many in Illinois who are veterans on the street, already, our own U.S. citizens who can't get a job. And now we're trying to accommodate illegals. Illegals. I, we have to say how it is. My family came over from Europe, waited four years. You know, we, we did what we had to do to come here. And I, I thank my parents every day. But how do we take care of people, our own people, give them dignity and justice, That's right. and then try to lift up millions of people that just broke the law, they did, broke the law, stepped in front of other people that have been waiting, and give them jobs. How do we do that with prices going up, things going crazy? It's a great question. So right, right now, I looked at the numbers uh, earlier this week. Uh, right now in America, there's 22 million job openings. 22 million job openings. Uh, the number that I showed you with people who are either not working or looking for work, it's 11 million people. So right now, we could fill every person who does not have a job in the United States of America if we pull them off. There's two openings for every job that's available. They exist inside of you. There is the opportunities. But I think that the, the, we're talking about two different things here. Because the question becomes, did they come here illegally? Absolutely. Should, should we have an obligation to the people who are here? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But there is the point on, they're here. And they're freezing. And they're living in the streets. And you see them. And I think our obligation, you know, and, and this is, you know, Matthew 25, I was naked and you clothed me. Right? And I was hungry and you fed me. And I think, I think the answer is, is we have to do both and we have to do a better job of both. You know what, My wife has a point here. Anna? I, I, yeah, you know I'm not asking you a question. I just want to <laughs> add on to what you're saying. Um, in that, I think part of what you're saying, with, with your question is we have all these people who are looking for jobs, can't get them. You're saying, hey, we have a lot of jobs. Part of the problem is it's what you're saying, what you're tackling here. It's the corruption that's keeping that's right. the people who are here from getting jobs. All that's right. So it's, it's what IPI is doing, what we're called to do, is to take down all the red tape, the corruption, um, the financial problems that are keeping, whether somebody's here, uh, was here before or not, uh, that's getting at the problem for everybody. So that, that is for everybody. It, it gets, it's hard, you know, like, it, like you're saying to the, the border issues, that's a separate <coughs> issue. Um, tough question, I laugh really hard when, um, the, the first question was asked, and I knew you were gonna enjoy that one. Um, but it is, it is like my husband was saying, we do, you know, that we talk a lot in our family about who is our neighbor, um, especially because we were saying we have the tent cities right by, we did have these these tent cities right by, we're walking our children by it. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a very complicated question, um, but I think to your point, your work in general is to 
make this a better place for everybody. And this may, quite frankly, this may be uh, the parable of the Good Samaritan, right? This is somebody that nobody else wanted and they're here. And so what is our responsibility towards them? So, so the question is, why will Mayor Johnson not work with private industries? Uh, Mayor Johnson is a socialist. And Mayor Johnson believes that the, the solution to every problem is government intervention. And really, the way that we frame things, honestly, at the Illinois Policy Institute, the lens that we look through is, does this lift up an individual? Does this give them more freedom? Or does this trap them down, right? And we have very different worldviews on this. He believes that the problem is we need more spending on education. We need more people inside of these public schools. We need more people on government dependency. More teachers at Manly, that's right, it's a jobs program. Yeah. So what he's looking at is he doesn't want private sector to come out on this. He wants government to be the solution because when you hold people down, right, this is how corruption exists. When you hold people down and they're dependent on you, then they will vote for you, then they will be with you. Um, and that's why, that's why he doesn't want to work with corporations on this. It's power. Mr. Weicker. Thank you for your enthusiasm and your philosophy. I deeply appreciate and support it. The one that you mentioned that, that a little bit when you know, school choice, actually what happened to the, uh, the uh, scholarship program? That, 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 uh, Tax credit uh, scholarship, that's right. Schools, and what's the, the stranglehold of the union and our mayor and our governor, how do we get school choice in Illinois? I mean, it might take 50 years at the rate of growth. And I don't be discouraged about it. It's so critical to changing the ignorance of so many people that they're being taught. Yep. How do we fix that? So I, Mayor Rahm Emanuel once said, never let a crisis go to waste. Um, and we see this right now in Chicago inside of our state. Uh, there's going to be a crisis. So the education tax credit scholarship still exists, right? It's not getting extended after this calendar year. So there is roughly 9,600 kids who can go to the school of their choice based on this tax credit program that we have in, inside of our state. So there's still hope inside of this, and we're going to continue to fight this and see can we get this extended inside the state. In the event that you can't, I think that there's a lot of different opportunities. First, uh, it polls at about 80%. So the majority of Illinoisans across the board want this. Now they're getting educated to what this means. We have 9,600 people, it's about 36,000 uh, who are graduates of this program, who are gonna be fired up and active. Uh, I'm going to be taking uh, busloads of kids uh, down to the uh, Democratic National Convention. We will be standing outside and we will have national cameras showing that this is the party who took away scholarships for these children, right? These underprivileged. The other group that we have, who I gotta say, I don't normally agree with them, uh, but are gonna be an ally, is these magnet schools. I mean, Mayor Johnson just said he wants to shut down, quite frankly, the best performing schools in our state. You know, this is Walter Payton, uh, this is Jones. And I gotta say, the parents are furious. I'm getting more calls from unlikely, you know, people who say, this has to stop. And I think what is happening right now for the first time is people are opening their eyes. I do not think school choice is dead in the, in the state of Illinois. I think there's opportunities with school boards. We're having conversations. I, so this is another thing to think about. We think of Illinois as just, this is a blue state and there's no opportunities. Uh, Aurora has a conservative mayor and a conservative assembly. Uh, this is the second biggest state or city in the uh, state of Illinois. Uh, Joliet, Peoria, Naperville. These are all opportunities to say, what can we do on the school board level for school choice to expand opportunities for these kids? So I think there is a ton of emotion around this. There's a bunch of people who have been had this taken away. Uh, and we're going to put national uh, media attention on this and we're going to go fight for it. That, that scholarship program was beautiful. I knew nothing and little about it. It wasn't talked about. The Archdiocese was a failure. I never heard one mention from our crazy administrators of the Archdiocese. That should have been promoted from each of the pulpits of the Catholic Church. I never heard it mentioned once at any pulpit I went to. I go to a lot of different churches. I didn't know how to fund it. I wanted to fund it. I had an idea I should fund it. Nobody ever gave me a certificate. Put some money on it. And I would have. And that's true of all our Catholic schools. Amen, amen, There's a amen. lot of people that would be giving money to Catholic schools if they're asked for it. Why do the priests don't want anything to do with Catholic schools because they're administrative quarter? They're hard to develop. 
it's it's the future of our church is the Catholic schools. And I've got money to get to them, no one ever asked for it. And they never asked for the scholarship money, at least not to great detail. That's right. Well, Maybe that's something that your organization could well, develop. I think amen on that. Well, the, the scholarship program, there's no longer, it would have been tax, tax years last year for this. Uh, but this is where the Catholic Church has always been, right? They've been in poor neighborhoods. They've been where people have had limited educational opportunities. And this is really the rise that we saw inside of Catholic schools. I think the thing that's critically important is we're not just talking about numbers here on can you read. You know, the truth is the benefit of Catholic schools, we're saving souls. Right, and that's where we have to fight for school choices because when the other option is a failed public school, we have the opportunity to bring kids into Catholic schools, evangelize to them, and I think we can save a lot of souls. So I think this is a fight that we need to fight, uh, not only as, you know, as me as a, as a conservative free marketer, but as Catholics, right? Because that's the future. We don't have nuns anymore the same way to teach, so we have to use the money that exists. Okay, I'm sorry to do this, but we have one more question. For time for one more question, I'm sure Matt will stick around for some private questions after this, it's already after two o'clock, and I know some of you have to get going. If you need to go, please feel free to go. So, all right, uh, Dr. K, here we go. That's kind of a homer pick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Well, um, the, the church, well, with the Center for Poverty Solutions, I see it as a reflection, actually, of the church. Uh, the church is the original Center for Poverty Solutions. Amen. And so what is the call to action for the church? Understanding with that that the church is the most powerful institution God created in the world. So how do we talk to, to people of faith to be able to assist with getting the things done that we see need to be done in our state? So yesterday, Dr. Cornegay actually and I had, a, had an interesting conversation. And it was about uh, charity. And I actually think that we need to rethink about what we mean by charity uh, right now in the United States of America. The, the adage that we get in our head, and when we think of poverty, we think of the poor who don't have food. But I was thinking about this from, uh, from actually something that Mayor Johnson recently said. So he wants to have a city-run grocery store. Right? That's what he said. It's like there's these areas that uh, academics call food deserts. There are areas where there's no fresh fruits, vegetables, or produce. Um, but the question isn't, is, is, to me, is why? So let's go through a quick thought exercise. Let's say that we, this right here is a community. We live in a neighborhood together. Let's say we have some money, some of us don't have as much money, right? And let's say that uh, somebody here, I'm going to make it uh, Kathy, owns a grocery store. Kathy owns a grocery store inside of this neighborhood, right? And she's selling and she employs her entire table. They all work for Kathy. Right? And they have jobs and they have dignity and opportunity. But let's say that there's a, a philanthropist who says, well, there's poor people. And how do we go serve them? So I start giving my money, right? And I start giving it. And I say, we need to feed the poor people inside of this, this room, right? This community. And I start giving money. And now all of a sudden, we start opening up food pantries and soup kitchens. So now all of a sudden, one block away from Kathy's grocery store, there's a food pantry. What's going to happen to her business? It's going to go down. People aren't going to go there anymore because her competition is free, right? And so what we're going to see is less and less people are going to go to Kathy's grocery store. All those people you see at her table right there, they no longer have jobs. So now they're going over to the food kitchen, right? And what about the restaurant owners? This table, who owns the restaurants? Where people are working and they have that first step on the economic ladder where they learn a skill. Now all of a sudden there's a soup kitchen that opens up because we want to be, we got to go feed these, these people. What happens to the restaurant? It closes. They go out of business. And all these people no longer have jobs. Very quickly, the economic state of this entire room falls dramatically. This is a different type of charity. This is a tough one for us to get our head around. Because right now in America, when we saw this miracle has happened, I looked up numbers on the CDC uh, two days ago. Let me throw in some, some quick context. If you look at the great leap forward in China, socialistic China killed somewhere between 30 and 45 million people of starvation. Last year in the United States of America, you know how many people died of starvation? 20. 20 people. That's an amazing achievement, right? We have solved some of that problem. But the truth is, is that we have to get away from the toxic charity. The charities that, 
make us the heroes. Wait, we give money and we're helping this person and we keep feeding them. Really, what we have to do is reform how we think about it. Ronald Reagan said we should judge welfare not based on how many people are on it, but how many people have gotten out of it. That's what charity is and how we define success of this poverty solutions, as you know better than anybody. It is not how many people did we serve, how many hot meals did we give, how many people did we force independency. The goal, let's open up some more restaurants. Let's get some more grocery store owners. Let's give people that dignity. And I think that's the refrain in how we need to rethink about charity in the United States of America. And I think it's going to move on. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you.